Good afternoon, and welcome to the fourth and final A Healthy Discussion hosted by Moy University and the Partnership for Better Health. This is a series of bipartisan forums that gives Iowa congressional delegation members their own platform for discussing critical health, wellness, and workforce policy topics with Iowans. It also provides us the opportunity to give input on what Congress does regarding health care reform in the next few years. I want to specifically thank the Moyne University and President Franklin for graciously hosting these important conversations along with the Better Partners for Better Health. The Iowa Initiative is a member organization of Partnership for Better Health, and I'd like to take this opportunity to share with you what PBH is all about. The Partnership for Better Health is a network of 63 health organizations, providers, advocates, and consumers whose goal is to address lowering the cost of health care through prevention, intervention, and innovation. It is the intent of the partnership to educate those who seek and hold political office in our country on these issues. Specifically, we want to ensure that elected officials understand the importance of prevention, intervention, and innovation in successfully influencing the cost and quality of health care. In the United States, three out of every four health care dollars are spent treating chronic disease, and with figures like that, it is easy to see why our health care costs are out of control. As Senator Harkin likes to say, we have a sick care system, not a health care system. Without investments in reducing chronic disease, the U.S. will never see a sustained reduction in the cost of care. That being said, the Partnership for Better Health does not support or oppose individual candidates or political parties in any way or advocate for any specific legislation. Our purpose is to educate and inform all candidates, regardless of political affiliation. On behalf of Partnership for Better Health, I want to personally thank Senator Harkin for his leadership in health care. Senator Harkin has been a longtime champion of Partners for Better, Partnership for Better Health and has fully embodied the triple solution in his policy agenda. Every step of the way, Tom Harkin has bent over backwards to meet us and to assist us in our advocacy efforts. Again, thank you for this wonderful turnout and your interest in the future of health care. And now, I have the honor of introducing President Angela Franklin. Angela Franklin became the Des Moines University's 15th president in the spring of 2011, and she has worked in higher education for more than 20 years. Previously, she was executive vice president and provost at Meharry Medical College in Nashville, Tennessee, where she oversaw academic and administrative departments. She served as acting president during the summer of 2009 and held a professorship in the Harris Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. Dr. Franklin is a native of McCormick, South Carolina, and a 1981 Phi Beta Kappa and Magna Cum Laude graduate of Furman University, a small liberal arts college in Greenville, South Carolina. A licensed clinical psychologist, she completed her PhD in clinical psychology in 1985 at Emory University, followed by a year-long clinical internship at Grady Memorial Hospital. Dr. Franklin recently concluded her fourth term as the Board of Trustee of Furman University. Please join me in welcoming President Franklin. Thank you, Ms. Peterson, and thank you to all for coming to the Long University today. Um, it's always a, a pleasure to have an opportunity to engage with our, our community leaders um, as we think about the institution of health and the delivery of care um, as we transform a, a community and a society. Um, Des Moines University is, is central um, to a lot of the conversations we've had. Um, we as an institution at Health Sciences University have been focused on sort of recalibrating our mission and our vision for the future. Um, and in this last year um, that I've been here as president, we've actually put forth a lot of efforts to redefine ourselves as a health sciences university and recalibrate our mission in a way that now says very distinctly who we are and where we're going. And I'd like to just share 
briefly with you the way forward for Des Moines University and our focus and our vision, which is directly related to the whole approach and the focus of what we're doing today. Um, our mission is to improve lives in our global community by educating diverse groups of highly competent and compassionate health professionals. Um, our focus vision for the future centers around four areas. We will be the leader in innovative health education that promotes lifelong learning. We'll be a cultivator of distinctive faculty and student researchers who discover and disseminate knowledge. We'll be a leader and partner of choice in the delivery of services that enhance health, wellness, and education in our communities, and a policy consultant and catalyst in health community transformations. When we had the opportunity to engage with the Partnership for Better Health, we saw this as central to our mission and our vision for the future, the Des Moines University of the Future, to engage more in the community to help be a catalyst for change. It's a pleasure for me to welcome all of you here to join with us as we hear from Senator Tom Harkin, and it's now my pleasure to introduce him to you. United States Senator Tom Harkin was born in Cumming, Iowa, and to this day lives in the house in Cumming where he was born. After graduating from Dowling High School in Des Moines, he attended Iowa State University on Navy ROTC scholarship, earning a degree in government and economics. Senator Harkin then served in the Navy as a jet pilot on active duty from 1962 to 1967, and later in the Navy Reserves. Senator Harkin's political career began in 1969 when he went to Washington to join the staff of Iowa Congressman Neil Smith. In 1972, Senator Harkin graduated from the Catholic University of America Law School in Washington, D.C., and his wife, Ruth, then returned to Iowa and settled in Ames, where Senator Harkin worked with Polk County Legal Aid. Ruth won election as Story County Attorney, becoming the first female elected to this position. In 1974, Tom Harkin was elected to serve in Congress from Iowa's 5th Congressional District. In 1984, after serving 10 years in the United States House of Representatives, he was elected to the United States Senate and has been re-elected five times by Iowa voters. Since arriving in Congress, Senator Harkin has championed issues that touch the lives of everyday Americans, health care, education, and equal rights. He has worked to transform America into a wellness society, focused on disease prevention and improving public health. He is a staunch defender of America's working families, and has led the fight to improve education and modernize school infrastructure. He has worked to reduce class size, give students better computer and internet access, expand school counseling and nutrition programs, and improve teacher training. In 1990, Senator Harkin sponsored and passed the Americans with Disabilities Act, landmark legislation that protects the civil rights of millions of Americans with physical and mental disabilities. He learned firsthand about the challenges facing people with disabilities from his late brother, Frank, who was deaf from an early age. Known as the Emancipation, Emancipation Proclamation for People with Disabilities, the bill has become Senator Harkin's signature legislative achievement. The law has literally changed the landscape of America by requiring accessible buildings and transportation and workplace accommodations for people with disabilities. In September 2009, following the death of Senator Ted Kennedy, Senator Harkin became chairman of the Senate Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee. This important committee is instrumental in health care reform, and Senator Harkin is intimately knowledgeable on medical education and the impact the Affordable Care Act will have on the future of health care. It is for these reasons that it is my pleasure to welcome Senator the Honorable Tom Harkin. Thank you very much for the very generous introduction. Thank you for the leadership here at the University. 
and thank you all for being here today. I uh, want to thank the University and the Partnership for Better Health for sponsoring these health forums, uh, featuring members of Iowa's congressional delegation. I'm very pleased to be joined by my longtime friend, Sally Peterson, my former lieutenant governor, and to hear about the great work that uh, she's been doing at the Iowa Initiative, providing an opportunity for Iowa to be a true leader among the states on the very important issue of unintended pregnancies. That five-year study has now been finished, and uh, uh, I don't know if you've been aware of the findings and stuff, but uh, quite spectacular in what, uh, what's happened here in the state of Iowa. My evidence is anecdotal, not clinical, but surely the most urgent an important health issue facing Iowans right now is high blood pressure and depression brought on by non-stop negative political ads. <laughs> Fortunately, we'll have a ready cure on Wednesday, November the 7th, and we'll all make the stops. <laughs> Unfortunately, we face broader national health challenges that have not been so easy to solve. Now, again, uh, we talk about uh, in, uh, prevention, uh, uh, intervention, and innovation. I'm going to focus my remarks today just basically on prevention and intervention, not innovation. Although we could talk about that. I have a long history of, uh, of being very supportive of the National Institutes of Health. And since 1989, uh, I've either chaired or been the ranking member of the appropriations subcommittee that, sub sub that funds the National Institute of Health. From 1989 until uh, just uh, two years ago, uh, either Senator Spector chaired it or I chaired it. And we just went back and forth as the Senate would go from Democratic hands to Republican hands and back and forth. And so we had a very close uh, working relationship I'm very proud of the fact that uh, under my chairmanship in 1989, we put the first money into the Human Genome Project, the map and sequence the entire human genome. And as you know, that has been a great success, has spurred all kinds of innovation. Uh, to those who sometimes say that government cannot create jobs, well, we put about $3 billion of your money, taxpayer money, into mapping and sequencing the human gene, which we did over a period of about 11 years. And uh, <coughs> since uh, 2000 or 2001, uh, a study has been done, it was done by the Patel Institute, Patel Institute of Indiana, Ohio, something like that, where is it? Ohio. The Patel Institute did a study of the ramifications of that investment in, the, in mapping and sequencing the human gene. And what they found is that in the last uh, 10 years, there have been over $700 billion, billion dollars of private investment just in the area of, of sequencing human genes and, uh, and, and genetic approaches uh, to health care uh, and other interventions. So quite frankly, that $3 billion really did spur a lot of economic activity over the next 10 years. But I, I, I'm going to, so I wasn't going to talk about it. So anyway, I'm not going to get into the, into the innovations unless you have some questions about that later. I want to focus most on end on prevention. I've always been appalled by the fact that in the United States we spend more than $2 trillion on health care each year, you know that, an estimated 75% accounted for by preventable, preventable chronic conditions. For too long, we've spent just four cents of every health dollar on prevention. And like clueless dodos, we wonder why health care costs are ballooning outside. It's, that, it's exactly this disconnect, these misplaced priorities, that inform key provisions in the health reform law which realign, realign the way that we approach these challenges. I know we hear a lot about on the Affordable Care Act, about the individual mandate, mm, this and that. But not much has been said and written about the realignment under this health care act, putting more focus on prevention and wellness than we've ever, ever had before. Now, 
as Sally said, uh, I have often used that phrase that we have a sick care system, a health care system. Eventually, sometime, you'll probably get help to your sickness when you're really at the end of the line, maybe in, in, a, in an emergency setting or something like that. But we all know that's the cost of this. Not just, not just in economic terms, the cost is in terms of human quality, human life, productivity, and everything else. But the problem is we waited until people develop serious illnesses, chronic conditions. We spent trillions of dollars for surgery, pills, hospitalization, and disability. This is absurd and it's unsustainable. On that score, let me quote a senator and former Democratic presidential candidate in 1992. By the way, you might remember that Senator won the Iowa caucuses in 92 as a favorite son, but wound up losing to some obscure fellow from Arkansas. <laughs> in a major policy speech in 1992, that candidate said, and I quote, most Americans spend more to maintain their cars than they do to maintain their bodies. But the same principles apply. Pay me now or pay me more later. After all, prevention is better than patching and fixing, because staying well is better than being sick. It's simple common sense, and it's time that our national health priorities reflected that. So by 1992, I had already become an outspoken public health advocate in Washington. The year that I announced my candidacy, I, the White House, I introduced major le legislation called Prevention First, with the aim of jumpstarting America's transformation into a genuine Genuine Wellness Society one focused on prevention and staying healthy. That same year, I was able to use my chairmanship to put a provision in the law that changed the name of the Centers for Disease Control. It used to probably be the Center for Disease Control. I changed it to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention to get them focused more on prevention. By 1998, I introduced the first comprehensive bipartisan bill to give FDA authority to regulate tobacco. Since I became chair, as I said in, uh, uh, in 2009, our committee has been a powerhouse of legislation focused on prevention. The committee's crowning achievement was the passage of the comprehensive bill that we know as Obamacare, or the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. I take special pride in having authored the law's landmark prevention title which includes a whole array of provisions focused on healthful lifestyles, good nutrition, physical activity, preventing chronic diseases. Uh, the time when we started this, Senator Cannon was still chair. He asked me to head that provision of it, and, uh, and then that's what I did and carried that through to the end. But I think these provisions are now moving us towards a true health care system. This is the realignment I talked about. One overall aim of the Affordable Care Act was to address the reality that at the federal level, in the clinical medical setting, in our communities, in our healthcare training, and in our workplaces, there's been an array of barriers, array of barriers to a stronger emphasis on wellness and prevention. Incentives have been misplaced, dismal results are plain to see. I've often said in, in, in our society, when you think about it, it's easy to be unhealthy. It's harder to be healthy. Why shouldn't that be the other way around? Why shouldn't it be easier to have the healthy choices uh, rather than the unhealthy choices? So a major aim of the Affordable Care Act has been to realign these incentives, to make it easy for Americans to stay healthy. But let me talk about the four levels that we put in the Affordable Care Act. Federal level, clinical level, community level, and workplace level. At the federal level, we created a new interagency council that's already been meeting already developing national prevention strategies. This council is comprised of every one of the secretaries from every one of the departments, Department of Agriculture, Department of Commerce, Department of Homeland Security, all of them. And I've been, I thought, you know, when we set this up, that the secretaries would probably send some lower level staff person to attend this. I was very surprised to find that the secretaries were attending this. If not the secretary, then the undersecretary. So, that's been pretty good. You're improving all the coordination so that what one department is doing is carried out and magnified by the other department when it comes to prevention and wellness. 
Uh, for most people, the most visible impact at, of the Affordable Care Act are at the clinical level. Thanks to the Affordable Care Act, Americans now have access to clinical preventative services from disease screenings to life-saving vaccines without any out-of-pocket contributions. This means that millions of Americans are catching diseases in the earliest phases, when they're the easiest and the least expensive to treat, or better yet, to prevent them from happening in the first place. Last year, which was the first year uh, of this being implemented, 86 million Americans received at least one free preventative service, including almost 1 million islands. Many care beneficiaries are staying healthier too, uh, and one of the provisions we put in there is that every person on Medicare gets a free annual wellness checkup, diabetes screening, colorectal screening, mammogram screening, uh, blood pressure, cholesterol, all of that kind of stuff. Body mass index, everything. Well, uh, in the first six months of this year, more than 13,000 islands on Medicare took advantage of their annual wellness visit provided by the Affordable Care Act. At the community level, the Affordable Care Act broke new ground by creating the Prevention and Public Health Fund. Now, this is a, this is a dedicated funding stream. We don't have to appropriate the money yet. It's a dedicated funding stream to support a broad range of prevention activities in the communities. Uh, during a time of many competing priorities, the Prevention and Public Health Fund aims to ensure sustained, sustained national investments in programs that promote physical activity, improve nutrition, and reduce tobacco use. The fund supports activities at the community level with community transformation grants. That's what they're called. Which help communities to create and implement evidence-based plans to make their citizens healthier. Communities tailor their grants to address unique health challenges in their area. We didn't want one size fits all. We wanted communities to come forward and say, okay, here's what we'd like to do. Here's how we'd like to address health in our community. Okay, we get a grant to implement that. So what's happened here in Iowa? In, in Iowa, in this last year, 26 communities the state of Iowa got these community transformation grants. I'm sorry, I forget the total amount of money overall. Maybe. How much? 300 million. How much? 300 million. 300 million. For all of that, was, that was for, for all of us. For all of Iowa. For all of Iowa. And so these community transformation grants are going out to really keep up these efforts of communities to address these issues. So there'll be uh, these screens will implement chronic disease self-management, providing education to kids about healthy eating. That's a challenge. <laughs> Distributing fruits and vegetables to low-income elderly families. Uh, it supports the diabetes prevention program, a partnership between the CDC and the YMCA and other groups, again, to deliver cost-effective interventions, uh, both here in Iowa and across the country. The last part was the workplace. The Affordable Care Act recognizes the workplace as a very important venue for fostering wellness and preventing chronic diseases. Again, I told here at Des Moines University, you understand that very well because this is the first educational institution to be designated a platinum well workplace by the Wellness Council of America. So. Example. Across America, companies are finding that investing in their employees' health is not only the right thing to do, but it's also good for the bottom line. That's why the Affordable Care Act also included important provisions to support employers in these efforts. For example, the law allows businesses to vary their health insurance premiums by up to 30% for employees based on their participation in and achievement in wellness programs. So, employees who agree to sign up for a wellness program, a physical exercise program, and a nutrition program, they could see their, their contributions to their uh, coverage reduced by 30%, up to 30%. That could be quite, a, quite an incentive for people at the business level to start getting involved. In addition, in addition the National Healthy Worksite Program funded by this prevention 
and public health one I was talking about, is assisting employers in implementing evidence-based prevention and wellness strategies among their employees. So businesses can actually get money from this fund to start implementing. And of course, we're making mostly a lot of small businesses. It's not a big business. All they have is it's the small businesses that have, that have trouble. Uh, but this program is establishing prevention programs in 100 workplaces this year alone. And one other thing about the Affordable Care Act that's important here at Moines University, the law is making major new investments to address the health care workforce shortage. As you know, strengthening and growing our primary care workforce is critical to reforming our nation's health care system. The Affordable Care Act invests in a new generation of primary caregivers by increasing resources for training, creating new incentives for providing primary care to patients, and supporting caregivers who choose to enter primary care in underserved areas. Now finally, let me just talk about the future of the Affordable Care Act. In June, as we all know, the Supreme Court affirmed the constitutionality, basically, of the law itself. Unfortunately, this has not stopped those who seek the law's total repeal, offering nothing serious in its place. I think this would be a tragic development for countless Americans, especially for the nearly 40 million Americans without health insurance, including millions with pre-existing conditions who will get coverage under the Affordable Care Act. But it would also be a tremendous setback, a tremendous setback to the new emphasis that we have put and the dedicated source of funding that we have for wellness and prevention and public health. I've often said the Affordable Care Act is not like the Ten Commandments, chiseled in stone. It's more like I got to the starter home, suited for improvement. So I've called on my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to join us in making sensible refinements as we continue to implement this law. I've invited them to bring their toolkits rather than their sledgehammers. So we can, we can work together to improve the law, any law. Uh, and have improvements, I'm sure, as we go along in the future. But I think the choice is very simple. Either we're going to go forward or go back and be dragged backwards. And I believe the vast majority of Americans get it when it comes to prevention and wellness. And, you know, your mother or grandmother was right, you know, for, now some prevention is worth a pound of cure. Or is that Ben Franklin who said that? Anyway, um, but we know that it's just that we haven't really put the emphasis. I think part of it, part of it is because we've been so great at developing interventions later on, new drugs, new therapies, new surgical things that 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 make you better again. But it's costing us a lot of money when we put that off and we treat it only with pills and surgery and, and those types of interventions later on. But we know and we have evidence, we have good evidence to show that people will change their lifestyles. People will do things to stay healthy as long as it's not too hard. <laughs> but if they have to jump through hoops and hoops and hoops, they say they have to. If I get sick, I'll... I'll take a pill. I'll do something else. So uh, we, we know that people, but we just have to make it easier. We have to implement this, as I, I've said, the clinical level, the community level, in our workplaces, and I mentioned at the federal level too, to get them all coordinated around the country. So if for no other reason, uh, I, I want to see the Affordable Care Act to continue because of this realignment that we're doing, this realignment uh, of, of our health care system. So again, um, uh, I just I just feel very strongly that, uh, as chair of the Senate Health Committee, that uh, we continue our efforts in that area, and that we don't back down or back off of that because I think we're on just right on the cusp of really changing the whole paradigm of healthcare in America. So with that, I will finish and be glad to get the rest. I just want to tell you, I was off by. Three million, not three hundred. Three hundred million nationally. Three million. Three million. That's right. Not three hundred. Too many zeros. I'm going to say twenty-six sites. Boy, they're just getting nice. Sorry, buddy. 
But I think it's the well, okay. That, that's the money we got. There's 26 communities. Well, with that, I'll open that open for questions and comments. Yes. I'm Janet Lyle from the Iowa Alliance for Retired Americans. Uh, what do you see as the next steps in healthcare? And especially, would you address how we can make sure that we preserve the benefits of Medicare for future generations and, and so forth? Uh, to preserve what? Benefits of, benefits of Medicare that we currently have for future generations. Okay, if I got Medicare, Jan, what was the first part of the question? The next step in healthcare. Well, the next step in health care is to, is to implement the Affordable Care Act. It, you know, we, we, we were setting up these accountable care organizations. And in 2014, one year and two months from now, uh, everyone's going to be covered by health and we're going to have all of these exchanges on which people can go to get health insurance if they can't afford it, that we're going to subsidy to help them buy that health insurance. So in 2014, about 30 to 40 million Americans who have no health insurance today as I stand here, somewhere between 30 and 40 million Americans have zero health insurance. In 2014, they'll have health insurance. That will be affordable. It will cover them, families, children. And you already know about the pre-existing conditions. Right now, it, the, 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 Insurance companies cannot discriminate on pre-existing conditions only for children. 2014, that applies to everybody. Um, so that's the next step, is to make sure we get the exchanges up and running next year. Well, by, by, by 2014. And that's happening. That's happening around the country. I'm always amused when a, a lot of governors have come forward and said they don't, they don't want these exchanges and stuff, but they but they took the money anyway to set them up. <laughs> and they're being set up. Because if a state does not set up an exchange, the federal government will set up the exchange for the state. Now, if you want to know what an exchange means and what it's like, look at my health insurance. And we kept hearing, well, you know, people say, well, we got to have the same kind of health insurance you guys in the federal government have. Well, I have an exchange. It's called OPM, Office of Personal Management. OPM. Every year in December, OPM puts out an array of health plans that you can choose from. Every year they have an open season where you can change without penalty. So, obviously, when I first entered Congress and didn't have children, we had one health plan, and then when we had kids, we switched to another health plan. Now that we don't have kids anymore, and they're gone, and we have another health plan. So, that's where the exchange is. And there's a lot of competition on this. Exchange. I think we have, well, I don't know, upwards of maybe 20 different plans, I think, that we can choose from. Broad variety. Uh, and it's not just me, I mean, everyone, I have the same exchange as a postal worker, as someone who works for Social Security, as someone who works for IRS, someone who works, you know, all those people that are out there checking when you go to the airport, Homeland Security, they got the same health care system I got. They work for the federal government. So we're kind of making that kind of exchange available to everybody. We have the same, same kind of system. That, that's the next step. Uh, Medicare, I, I've been having a number of hearings in my committee because, tell me I share health, education, labor, and pensions. And perhaps one of the most underreported crises facing America today is the lack of pensions the lack of retirement security for people in our country. I'll put it this way. Uh, in 1980, 30 years ago, one out of every two Americans had a pension. One out of every two Americans had a pension that would last them until they died. Today it's one out of five. One out of five. Two out of five Americans. Two out of five Americans have nothing. They have no pension. They have less than $10,000 in savings, and no need to have a Social Security. The Social Security was never meant to be a total retirement plan. It was one of the legs of the stool, Social Security, pensions, and savings. And so now we're entering a phase where people simply don't have enough to live on once they're retired. 
So I've been having a number of hearings on retirement. So I have come up with a proposal that I floated out this spring on setting up a new type of retirement system. Now, I'm not going to get into that. So what's that got to do with Medicare? Obviously, one part of the retirement system is your health care is Medicare. Uh, Medicare is in trouble, got some funding problems, I understand all that. Two things. One, we hope that by focusing more on wellness and prevention and getting people in earlier in Medicare so they take these wellness checkups every year, that now the cost per person of Medicare will start to abate because we'll get the people a lot earlier. But the second thing is, uh, is to have a system uh, whereby, um, whereby we can fund Medicare in a way uh, through both the Medicare checkoff when people work, but maybe also through other sources uh, where Medicare can be funded. And where the elderly will now, again, uh, one of the reasons we're setting up the affordable care organizations, accountable care organizations, not affordable, accountable care organizations, is again to, to focus on on Medicare, on people who are in Medicare, uh, to make sure that we don't just have a fee for service, where people get paid for every time they do a procedure, but what's your outcomes? What are we looking at in terms of your outcomes? Then pay for that. But sometimes you get a better outcome for fewer procedures than you do with more. So we're trying to break down that fee for service structure in Medicare. And also, uh, one of the things that you're hearing a lot about now, uh, on this $716 billion that Obama took out of Medicare. Interestingly enough, uh, Mr. Ryan and his budget has the same figure. $716 billion out of Medicare. Well, but where that money comes from uh, having more accountability in how we buy our drugs, and where we source them, how we pay for them, uh, how we're paying for um, Part D of Medicare uh, by taking some of the money out of the high reimbursements we're giving to insurance companies and health providers uh, in Medicare. Uh, and that's, that's where that's set, but that 716 billion was put back into Medicare in a different form. In a different form, lowering premiums, better coverage, that type of thing. Uh, but that's not what's, that's not, 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 what, that's not what's being said. But though, that's, to me, that's how you say Medicare. It's not, it's not, uh, it's not a real big, huge problem uh, as, as I see it. But all these things working together, I think, will, uh, will tend to, to make Medicare more cost effective. One thing, that I have advocated for a long time. I'm still advocating it. Uh, we haven't gotten there yet, but we keep trying. Why shouldn't Medicare have a purchasing system to purchase drugs just like the Veterans Administration does? The cheapest drugs in America right now are in the Veterans Administration. Why is that? Well, because they buy in, in mass. You wonder why the Canadian drug prices are so much cheaper than the U.S.? Because the Canadian government buys all the drugs. The Canadian government buys all this. And so when they deal with uh, drug companies, they buy huge quantities and they drive a top quality. We don't do that. <clears throat> so why shouldn't Medicare operate like the Veterans Administration? You save a lot of money. Anyway. So are they going to, are you going to propose that they do that? Oh yes. Oh yeah, I don't think we've been, we've been hammering on that for a long time. I tried to get it to the Affordable Care Act, we, we lost, obviously. So the fees that they're cutting to pay the hospitals and procedures, and the fees that they're going to cut to the doctors, to try to control the costs, is it, they're saying that that's going to cut down primary care people because they're not going to think they get paid enough? Is there some fact to that? No, I think that, you know, it's going to be a shift again. I mean, look, um, when, you pay, when you pay for every service that's provided, 
There's no way you can pay God to provide more food, so I get more money. But if it's based on outcomes, based on outcomes, and you get a certain plan to pay for certain outcomes, well, that's going to save money. Now, will some doctors who, let's face it, there are some who are gaming the system. There are drug companies who are gaming the system all the time, and we're always getting uh, you always hear about fraud in the Medicare system. The Attorney General's going after somebody. And, what was it? The biggest one was just some drug company. When it was recently, two billion dollars or something like that. One of the biggest settlements in history. They were gaming the system, and so you try to close those little loopholes. What have they done it for? Well, I don't know. I suppose the. Uh, I guess we haven't really kind of faced a crisis before of this magnitude. Uh, we never had a comprehensive health care bill before. Uh, it's the kind of thing you just, at least I sense, you can't just attack piecemeal or something, but I guess, I just guess we felt like we were doing okay and we just keep hoping along. I, I don't know if I had a better answer for you why we didn't go before now. I mean, Hey, look, look, you're, you're talking to someone here who is for a single payer system. But, why don't we have it? Well, obviously, I don't have the majority. <laughs> Hi, I'm Molly. I'm a second year medical student here. And as medical students, we're really concerned with the sequestration cuts to Medicare and how that's going to affect our graduate medical education funding and furthermore, how that will affect health care and providing more primary care providers. Well, I think, I think that uh, the sequestration, you heard the question about sequestration. Um, sequestration is not going to happen. It's just not. Uh, why? Because both sides, the defense industry and the non-defense industry, are both can't handle it. I mean, the, 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 the cuts. I just met with my nurses advisory committee meeting this morning and looking at some of the cuts Carol, you know this, it's only because it would come in Title V for the Terminal Child Health Care Program, almost they would devastate uh, for, for people, not only in Iowa, but around the country. So we just can't allow that to happen. Well, look, everyone thinks the sky is going to fall on, the, on January the 1st. That's not so. Uh, first of all, there's the tax cuts that end at the end of the year, and we snap back to 2001. Well, a lot of people said we can't do that. We've got to take care of that before the end of the year. Well, maybe yes, maybe no. Maybe when we come back in January, that might be the best time to do it rather than a lame duck session. And then look at sequestration. So sequestration says that we have to do uh, 55 billion defense, 55 billion non defense first year. It didn't say we had to do it in January or February or March. It just says for the fiscal year. Well, okay. So, the department could say, well, we're not going to cut in January, but we'll take all our cuts in the next quarter. Or the next quarter. Which gives us breathing room in order to address the whole sequestration issue. Now, do you know how this sequestration came about? This came about a year ago when we tried to increase the debt ceiling. Increase the debt ceiling. And there were those in the House, more than the Senate, in the House, who would not agree to vote to increase the national debt. Well, we faced a real catastrophe. The United States of America has never defaulted on a bond since the Revolutionary War, since Alexander Hamilton set the structure up. In the revolution, after the Revolutionary War. We have never, never has the United States ever defaulted. Now, when you say raise the national debt, because we don't raise the national debt, but that's just to pay for what you've already voted for. So a lot of people that said they weren't going to vote to raise the national debt have already voted, for example, to fund the Iraq War by borrowing money. Not to raise taxes, but to borrow money. You are already voted that way. Now you got to pay for it. Now the debt thing has to be raised, pay for it. Or they voted for Afghanistan, or they voted for this, or they voted for whatever. 
What if we just pick Jewish tax cuts? The bread in the treasury. Well, okay, then you've got to make up for it some ways. You can borrow money. But raise the debt ceiling simply means pay much for all you put on your credit card. I've often used that analogy. Those that didn't want to raise national debt are the people that say, hey, I ran up my credit card, but I'm not going to pay the bill. Who's going to pay the bill? You're going to pay the card, you're going to pay the bill. So, but they were adamant. They weren't going to raise the national debt. We were facing a, a calamity of default and what that might have in ramifications around the globe. So a deal was struck. Okay, we won't we'll raise the debt, but we have to reach an agreement on how to reduce our deficit uh, over the next 10 years by the end of this year. And if you don't, then we will automatically, there will be an automatically across the board cut of around 55 billion a year on everything. Now, what is so stupid about that is that good programs get cut along with anything else. You can have something that everyone agrees that we ought to do, like, oh, let's say, I think there's a general consensus in America that color grants are a good thing. But we should fund color grants. That's across the board, Republicans, Democrats, all agree on color grants. Well, they'd be cut automatically. Automatically. So everything gets an automatic cut. Well, like, that's not the way legislature should operate. I mean, if we're going to make cuts, well, let's we'll vote. We'll, we'll cut this and not cut this. We'll cut this a little bit more than we'll cut that. That kind of thing. This is across the board everything. So that's why I say it's not going to happen. Uh, it's not logical. It's not fair. We shirk our responsibilities as legislators by displaying some automatic cut, cut things that the, I think the general consensus is that we shouldn't cut. Um, even in defense, I agree that defense should be cut, but this cuts everything. It cuts some of the, what I might consider good programs in defense, along with those that are kind of boondoggles. Well, that's in the eye of the beholder, I guess. But nonetheless, we don't even get a chance to debate it or to vote on it. So, I don't think sequestration is going to happen. We'll do something that may not happen in December in the lane drive session, but it may happen in January. Now, if I can put on my political hat here a little bit, maybe a little bit more than I have, <laughs> my, my political hat, here's why I think it's going to happen in January and February. Uh, my friends on the Republican side of the aisle have all basically sign an oath that they're not going to vote to increase taxes. Okay, fine. Well, done that. And uh, they don't want to break that pledge. What happens at the end of December without any votes being taken, the tax bill reversed to 2001. So all the Bush tax cuts are in, it's all wiped out. We go right back to where we were in 2001. There is a general agreement, I think, on both sides of the aisle that that really wouldn't be the best thing to do. That we need some adjustments in there on different rates, that type of thing. So, if we wait and it snaps back in 2001 and we come back in January, no one has to vote to increase taxes. Because everything will be cut from 2001. Now, again, I assume that Republicans will want to cut it more than Democrats. Fine, that's a good debate to have. They might want to do it here rather than here. That's a good debate to have. That's a good way to vote. You see, my point is, no one will ever have to vote for a taxes. It gets everybody off the hook. Yes? You mentioned that critics of the Affordable Care Act want to repeal it, but that you would be open to something refinements in mind. Are there things that you would specifically look at changing? I mentioned one that I've been critical of, not that Medicare right. But if we get there, maybe a little bit. But I'm sure there are other things that need to be adjusted and stuff as we go along. Um, uh, I'm sure if we start to set up these changes. 
will cause them to find some problems out there and how these exchanges are run. What's the subsidy level going to be for people to on the exchanges? I'm sure those are going to have to be modified, worked on. I'm not certain that we did the right thing and what we said it at that time. Um, Maybe it's some things the macro mentioned fund maybe needs to be changed for a bit. I don't know. I'm just saying that as we go along, as we hear back from the public on the implementation of this, and we see problems crop up, okay, fine, let's fix it. Senator Grassley came and visited to speak about the healthcare system. One of the salient points of his discussion with us was that he was upset um, the way the Affordable Care Act was passed without Republican support. Um, the total partisan gridlock that has characterized our Congress ever since shows that he's not the only one. So have you talked to him about this? How do you plan to like get through that? <laughs> And why is professional courtesy in Congress taking precedence over people's lives? Are you suggesting we engage in fisticuffs? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, this is a debate. I, 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 we've had some of these debates on the Senate floor. I, I think these would be good open public debates. Uh, to have, I'd be glad to uh, appear with my friend. And I get along very, very well with each other. But we have disagreements, so that's fine. Uh, they don't spill over any personal kinds of things at all. But when you talk about, well, the Affordable Care Act passed without any Republican votes, well, let's look at this. Just from my committee standpoint, uh, we've run out a bill. Well, first of all, let me back up. We had a meeting in the White House early on that President Obama called us all down the White House. When I said all, he called down the leaders of the Senate and the House, both parties, the leaders of the two relevant committees in the House and in the Senate, Health Committee, Finance Committee, Ways and Means Committee, Commerce Committee, and then the leaders of the House and Senate, Speaker. Majority leader at that time. Okay, so we sat around this big table. Senator Grassley was there because he was ranking member on the finance committee. And I was there because of my position uh, on the health committee. And so we sat around, we started Thursday at noon, well, about 1 o'clock Thursday. We met all Thursday afternoon, all day Friday. We started Friday at 9 in the morning, met until midnight Friday night. And then we came back Saturday morning and met until about noon or 1 o'clock on Saturday. Rick Obama was there for the entire thing, sat right there. He left a couple of times to do the president has other things to do. <laughs> then he go out and come back. But I mean he was engaged. And and we were going through this and we were saying, okay, now I can remember him challenging somebody who called me and said, wait a minute, this individual mandate, Senator Hatch, you supported that in the nineties. Senator Grassley, you supported it openly an individual mandate in the 90s when the Hillary bill, that, that health care thing was So we're, we thought this would be something that we would all agree on, on an individual mandate. Well, that's just called that. We kept asking, what if you don't like this, what else should we do? And I can tell you without any fear of, 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 of being contradicted or anything, we sat there for all that time and could not get anything off of us that we could work on. It was just always nitpicking what we had come up with. That's one. Second, in my committee, we had the bill. And I wasn't sharing at the time, Chris Dodd was. Uh, Senator Dodd was sharing. And we brought the bill to our committee and we had four days of markup. I forget how many hours. Countless hours. Of marking the bill up. No amendments were denied. Anyone could file an amendment. 
No one was denied the opportunity to offer an amendment, to debate it, discuss it, without being cut off. At the end of about four days, our committee had adopted 166 Republican amendments. There were like 300 some filed. They didn't bring them up. Now, some duplicated, but some of that 166 were voted on, and they got enough Republicans and enough Democrats to vote for it, so it was adopted. Others were adopted by voice vote or unanimous consent. So 166 amendments were offered and were adopted in our bill. When we finished, I can remember, Senator Ross says, does anyone have any other amendments? I don't want to cut anybody off. We'll stay here for another week if we have to. That was the end of it. We had our vote, and yet we could not pick up one Republican to vote for it. Even after they'd gotten 166 amendments in our bill. I don't know what you deal with, how you deal with something like that. I just don't. And so it, it came to the point where, yes, we had to have, and because of the filibuster in the Senate, we had to have 60 votes to overcome the filibuster. And that was the basic vote that we took on Christmas Eve of 2009, was that 60 vote filibuster. And that is something else. I tell you that you know you talk about gridlock. Think about this. All the time that Lyndon Johnson, you can read Robert Carroll's books. They're, they're really good. All the time that Lyndon Johnson was majority leader of the Senate, vice president, and president. And you think about the panoply of legislation that was passed. Medicare, Medicaid, Voting Rights Act, Civil Rights Act, all, think about all this legislation that was passed. During all that time, he had one filibuster. Since my party has taken over the Senate in 2007, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, during that period of time, we have had 382 filibusters. which requires 60 votes. Well, we only got, well, we got 53. Well, there was a time we had 60, uh, and then went down to 59, and then the last election down to 53. It's tough to get 60, I mean, 60 votes. So I was at a conference in Brussels, Belgium this August, and we had a member of parliamentarians from Europe who were quizzing me and some other senators about this facet of American democracy. They could not understand. How is it that a minority gets to control what goes to the Senate? They said, we operate on majority vote, not minority. And it's true. A minority in the United States Senate now determines what goes to the United States Senate. That's and democracy or democratic principles on its head. You know, my view has always been the majority should propose legislation, but the majority should that the rules ought to be in place so that the minority has the right to amend and debate that legislation. But they shouldn't have the right to just stop it. To just stop it. So a handful, literally a handful of senators, four or five or six senators, do not stop anything in the United States Senate. So when you have 382 filibusters, I mean, you're the biggest filibuster. You need 60 votes to do anything. Uh, that leads to gridlock. Again. In 1995, you can check the record on this, the Democrats lost the Senate in the 94 election. I'm now on the minority. On the first day of the Senate in 1995, I proposed a resolution and the rules. You adopt the rules, you know, when they come in the first day. So I thought, I, I proposed a resolution to change the filibuster. And you're basically, you're rid of it, changing it, so it would stop things any longer. Well, we debated a little bit. I got 26 votes for it. I've kind of been trying it ever since, but I, I can't get the support. I, I couldn't get support for it. Well, now it's kind of come to a head. And, and I pointed out at the time that I was in the minority. And a lot of my fellow Democrats said, well, Harkin, are you nuts? <laughs> We're the minority now. We need that fellow of us to stop them. I pointed out, this is in the Congressional Archive, I pointed out in, in, in that January day in 1995, 
I said, you know, I looked at the record. If you go back and you see what's happening, when the Republicans are in charge, Democrats will do filibusters. I use this example. I said, okay, so the Democrats do 20 filibusters. Republicans get in charge the way they did those 20 times. We'll do two, three times. And a few years later, then the Democrats get back to us and you did it to us 30 times. We'll do it to you 60 times. I said, this is like an arms race. I said, this is 1995. If we don't get a handle on this, this place is going to come to a screeching grinding halt. I said, that's 1995. I had no idea what I was talking about. I mean, <laughs> I'm just throwing it all out there, you know? But that's what's happened. We had an arms race. And sure enough, when the Democrats got back in charge for a couple of years ago, all of us were everything. The Republicans got back in charge, all of us were everything. I, it, it, it's become an escalating arms race, and we've got to stop it. That's the good one that's taking place in Washington right now, is the bill of us in the United States. Senator Harkin, we know you have a very demanding schedule. Thank you from all of us for being here. Okay.